William Eggleston is one of the most influential and original photographers alive today. You've been behaving yourself. He's an unlikely hero of the contemporary art world, a non-conformist southern aristocrat who is also a true American pioneer. Forty years ago, he dragged colour, kicking and screaming, into the world of art photography. Seventy years old, and still as rebellious as ever, Eggleston's unique vision shows no sign of letting up. I know quite a few people are quite afraid of him. If he doesn't like you, he can, he can just kill you off in a minute. Right, that, that's one of the stupidest questions I've ever been asked. Now, with a stunning retrospective touring the globe, and a generation of young photographers clambering over each other to claim him as an influence, Eggleston is at last ready to talk about his work. For many years, he was frustratingly elusive. But just over a year ago, Eggleston allowed director Rainer Holzheimer to come and observe him at work in Memphis, actually taking photographs on the road. That footage forms the backbone to tonight's Imagine and gets us closer to this remarkable figure than ever before. William Eggleston was born in Memphis, Tennessee in 1939 and still lives and works there today. He's on a photographic excursion with his son Winston. In a career spanning almost 50 years, Eggleston has shot thousands of photographs here, in and around his hometown. His subject matter is the banal and everyday. Pieces yet. Often people ask what I'm photographing. Which is a hard question to answer. And the best I've come up with is I just say, life today. I don't know whether they believe me or not. <laughs> or what that means. I don't know what to say about that, but it's 
today. <laughs> Eggleston hardly ever gives titles to his photographs. I don't particularly even like to identify where or the date. I don't. That's just not about photography. I do have a personal discipline. I've only taken one picture of one thing. Not two. I would take more than one. I'd get so confused later. And I was trying to figure out which was the best frame. I said, this is ridiculous. I'm just going to take one, that's going to be. Eggleston got his first camera at the age of 18. He started off in black and white, printing the pictures himself. I didn't know anything about photography. Um, relied on reading things like literature from Kodak, or some company like that. No, they weren't. There wasn't much of that around either. <clears throat> I had to sort of teach myself. Even in the early black and white photos, he chose subjects similar to those he would later shoot in color. They're everyday, unspectacular moments, shot without any photojournalistic ambitions. My friend, who also was interested in photographing, at one time he bought many books containing photojournalism pictures. To me, they were not interesting. But then I found this one. I said, my God, this is, this is not just photojournalism. This is great art, <laughs> compositions, obvious knowledge of painting. A lot of Degas in here, the great painters, and the way of composing. And they're still great. The great influence was Cartier Bresson. There's such extraordinary structure. And what seems so fleeting, this famous decisive moment, but when you break down the frame, the frame has its, its inherent geometry and it's fluid and I think that's what Eggleston aspired to. I love Eggleston's black and white photographs. The composition appears so intuitive, so natural, you know, it's not forced upon us at all. It, it appears the simplest thing but of course when you analyze it, it becomes actually quite sophisticated and uh, and the messages that these pictures uh, you know, can release to us are quite complex and fascinating. And that, of course, is the hallmark of a very good Eggleston. One thing that I will never forget that really stuck in my mind that Bill did say to me earlier on, you know, when, we, when he was talking to me about photography, he said, now you must not take anything for granted when you're looking at a picture. Never do that. Every single little tiny space on that page works and counts. It seemed so 
almost cack-handed because there'd be things missing maybe where you expected to see maybe a complete figure or or a complete component or a subject. It might be split or cut off or there'd be weird things maybe sometimes happening around the edge of the picture which turn out to be incredibly important in terms of understanding Eggleston's aesthetic. William Eggleston's work is rooted in his origins. He comes from a well-to-do family, but owns several cotton plantations in Tallahatchie County in Mississippi. Bill Jr. grew up in Sumner, in his grandparents' house, where his cousin lives today. Bill was the first grandchild, and my grandfather went absolutely just crazy over this child, from what I've heard because he was a child and a new victim. And he was also a boy and he had never had sons. So I think he just pretty much commandeered Bill from the get go. So my grandparents, I don't say they kidnapped him, but <laughs> they had a lot to do with his upbringing here. And they had lots of servants here. And uh, it was just a great household from what I understand. Agriculture has always been the greatest single activity of the southeastern people. Nearly half of them are directly dependent upon the soil with greatest proportions in Mississippi and Arkansas. An unusual youth, described by his mother as brilliant and strange, Eggleston amused himself by playing the piano, building electronic gadgets, and even bugging his own family with hidden microphones. Never academically inclined, he nonetheless spent six years at various universities, studying art, but without ever graduating. Meanwhile, around him, America was changing. The car was reshaping society. Suburbs, shopping malls, and drive-ins were sprouting like a fungus across the South. Bill at one time said to his great, highly respected friend, well, what am I going to photograph? Everything around here is so ugly. And our friend said, photograph the ugly stuff. Well, we are surrounded everywhere with this plethora of shopping centers and ugly stuff. And so that is really initially what he started photographing. We all sort of thought of like in this way, that none of us was <clears throat> interested in what back then, it was a long time ago, was considered art photography, which was very large negative landscapes, people like Ansel Adams, Edward Weston. In the mid-1960s, Eggleston changed the course not only of his career, but of photography. He shot his first role of color film. Let's go back to the 60s. A lot of these are Las Vegas, actually. And that's the way people looked back then. <laughs> His color is just sort of the color of nothing, if you like. It's just ordinary life. And, and it's funny that, uh, you know, originally he started in black and white, he moved to color. And, and I guess for him, it wasn't an issue. But the, you know, in the time, you have to understand, if you're a serious photographer, you had to be uh, working in black and white. So when he came along and did this sort of nothingness color, it wasn't decorative, it was just ordinary life. It was quite radical because it was just so underplayed. And it took us a long time to understand and appreciate that. They all look alike. There's probably 
20 different ones of the same exact house. You know? Now, why is that good? I mean, look at her face. She's sort of um, acknowledging him being there, and yet there's something disturbing about her. It, it's it's great, and the the chain is just wonderful. I mean, you, you would pray to have a chain like that, and just to use it as a prop. And of course, it's just a pure coincidence that it just happens to be there with that woman. So, serendipity. You want to get out and walk around, or? Eggleston is not best known for his portrait work. A shy man, he seldom dares to invade people's private space with his camera. But when he does capture them, he does it so gently and fleetingly that they often don't realise. him having me sit still for what felt like hours, you know, when I was four or five years old. Um, but he, he did that to his advantage because he couldn't do that to your average, you know, woman sitting on a street corner. He couldn't tell them to be still. So he used that to his advantage. But, and I, I became really good at it, at being still and not looking at the camera and being very comfortable in front of the camera you know, doing whatever it is that I was doing, but knowing that there was always somebody looking at me. I think he was trying things out, you know? So he was a sort of experimenting on me, because I don't think that that's the way that he actually takes pictures. He got really into um, collecting Leica screw mount bodies and Canon. And he, and he, I remember he, um, he bought this briefcase and had it specially made to where he could keep all of his cameras in here and put these little separator things on here. And, you know, he, I just remember these all over the house. And he'd get one in every other day and do things to them, modify them, or try to take them apart, you know, stuff like that. He's always enjoyed um, cameras almost like he has guns. He's, he really likes guns a lot. Not that he likes to shoot, but he just likes the way they feel and the way they're made and like he says the precision of them and all that and it, it kind of goes together with cameras in a way. So uh, that is I, um, a picture, pretty well known photograph of dad's and uh, this was very typical. Dad used to take me around with him a lot shooting and uh, uh, this is probably Mississippi or, you know, the outskirts of Memphis. He made me stand there for that picture, but you can see how excited I was. I froze like, you know, little, little kids do. This boy looks like he could have just fallen from the sky, from another world, which again, of course, connects to um, this very powerful capacity that Eggleston has when he's actually photographing the world around us, as if it's the strangest possible place. I know that his photographs are very indicative of, of who he is and how he sees life. And I have always seen that, not only in his photographs, but in how he looks at things and what he looks at and what he notices. You know, he definitely has a different eye. I mean, I've seen him stare for hours at a china set, you know? <laughs> and not a, not a particularly valuable china set, you know? <laughs> 
You know, it's sort of maddening too, but it's extraordinary. <laughs> I'd like to take that home. Both of them in the living room really make Rosa happy. Eggleston treats everything he sees equally, whether it's people or things. He even photographs nothing and declares it a picture. He describes this as photographing democratically. He takes very ordinary situations and can create very powerful pictures um, out of almost nothing. And therefore, he's not relying particularly on the ultimate decorative thing, like a nice sunset or the incredible nostalgia, which often you'll see in contemporary practice. So I'd say he's sort of beyond that, if you like, because he, he's almost photographing on the, the gap between everything else. He's the freest person I've, 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 I've ever met. He just does what he wants. And, it, you know, and if you go to Memphis, you know, there's, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I was like totally disappointed when, when I got there. I was thinking, oh my God, this is like visually so boring. It's like an awful place. <laughs> it's really dull. There's nothing going on. Even relatively straightforward pictures like the blue vase on the table here, because of the colour and because of the density and the hues throughout, the tone, the tonal range throughout the photograph, you have, rather than what you might expect to get in a home of this type, a sense of well-being and safety and harmony, you have a very disconcerting feeling of dark forces. It's just brilliant. I worked with him and uh, we're sitting in this park bench and we're sitting there. I look over and there's this uh, rubbish bin. Right at that moment, he's sort of looking over and standing up and taking that photograph, like he does, very elegantly. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to get my own William Eggleston photograph. That's excellent. <laughs> get up make sure I'm gonna get it, as I do, you know, because I'm me and, I'm, and he's him. Two years later, this picture was there. I thought, oh, fuck, man, this looks fantastic. What a great photograph, and I knew mine just didn't work. It just didn't turn out. That's something quite bizarre and, uh, and quite magical that, uh, you know, one person is never the same as the other, and, and you can't do the same thing. He went to photograph someone's wedding, and apparently he was shopping around photographing ashtrays or something, you know. But he then presented, I think he presented the bride and groom with a set of prints and they were just of the sky. Poses a picture, it's like it's very light. It's like a beautiful melody. It's like very light. It's it's it just totally works. It's not forced, it's not it's not hammer method. It's like uh, it just works. Eggleston's compositions. May owe something to the fact that he had a friend working in a drugstore photo lab. He'd hang out there, watching family snapshots fall from the machine. When it came to processing his own prints, however, he stumbled upon something more sophisticated. The creme de la creme of printing processes, dye transfer, boasts incredible saturation and colours which never fade. Eggleston was the first to bring it into the art world. It was a very old process and used almost completely for 
fashion advertising. And I never heard of uh, it being used for non-commercial art photography, what I was doing. And I had two prints made right away. And I was astonished at how good the material is. Color accents also underline the feeling of the uncanny radiated by Eggleston's pictures. By emphasizing emptiness and isolation, and by not explaining what's really going on in a picture, he creates an atmosphere of apprehension and unease. as if it's a red is at war with all the other colors. Eggleston's most famous photograph, untitled Greenwood, Mississippi, 1973, shows a bright red ceiling. It was taken inside the house of his best friend, T.C. On an evening, he and his wife and I The three of us were lying in this big bed talking. And I had my black camera. And I had a flash. I looked up and, and took the picture. Then we continued talking. TC was later murdered in his house hit in the head with an axe, and then his house was set on fire. He was a dentist by profession. He loved drugs. That could have been what the murder was about. Uh, not heroin hard, but some pharmaceuticals. Because he was a doctor, he could get in. And the red ceiling is um, simply a red ceiling with white diagonal cables and a light bulb hanging down in the middle. There's a Kama Sutra freeze. There's something pornographic here, almost. It's the site of a murder, a horrible murder. The walls are bleeding. This is, this is something terrible that's happened in this room. It also could be uh, witnessed by a fly, you know, buzzing around that bulb in the afternoon heat. The room probably stinks one picture of a red ceiling and it can carry all that. It is about surface and it's not about surface. It is about what it depicts and it's not. It's about something much more. TC's murder is just one episode in a highly unconventional private life involving guns, drugs, drink and women. Eggleston used to keep two large houses in Memphis, one for his wife and children, the other for his mistress with each woman aware of the other. I remember he said, Jörn, we have a couple of things in common, <laughs> which is uh, uh, drinking, smoking, and women. And photography just gets us out of the house. <laughs> in the early 70s, he hung out with Andy Warhol in New York and had a long-standing affair with Viva, one of the stars of Warhol's factory. It was Warhol who introduced him to the emerging video scene and the Sony Portapack camera. It was such a new thing and it didn't look like a camera. It just was about the size of a cigar box. Didn't make any sound. It was not awesome to the subjects. They weren't quite sure what was going on. You know. It wasn't like I was holding the camera up, snapping, you know. 
You're an imposing asshole, Eggleston. He took one back to Memphis and out to the bars and clubs where he captured his friends, drunks, geeks, and quailude-popping misfits in raw, unedited form. The footage later became known as Stranded in Canton. This company made a pickup tube that operated in infrared. You use it in, in a club where we can barely see anything. A person's skin would be kind of translucent and whitish because it was really registering the heat more than reflected light. Amber, you fool. Amber. <laughs> I never did know what to do in life. Those are back in the days when everyone liked quaaludes. Let's get down. What will it do to your head? Oh, my God! <laughs> Trinidad in Canton just isn't about anything but itself. Those pieces, it just, they're just part of my life. <laughs> about another side of the world. The border back was like when the 35 millimeter camera was invented. There wasn't anything before like that. It really worked pretty well. Good, I get my, get my teeth real good. Get, I want my gums. Get my gums. I have perfect gums, Egg. Look at these gums. I would start and stop when I thought it was the right time. The term edit didn't go through my mind, really. The film's a natural extension of his shooting style, loose, organic, and one take only. It's fantastic. It's a total masterpiece. It's f wild. thinking of in terms of movie making and I thought what a great way of making a movie. You know, all these normal movies with a story from A to B and da 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 da. So boring. I just thought it was really, really fantastic. It was just out there. It was really good. He really believed in keeping spontaneity, I guess, in children. And he very often would wake us all up at all hours of the night. He believed it was good for your character to have that kind of <laughs> spontaneous exposure. That morning was one of those events where he pulled us out of bed, put us, plopped us on the front porch, and turned the cameras on. He did it on more than one occasion. And, you know, I grew up as a kid, really loud music, you know, at all hours. They're just ready for anything. Ah, ah, see. Stranded in Canton. He is a quirky character. I mean, you know, with the drinking, the guns, the strange place that he lives the weird relationship you have with his wife and his children. I mean, you know, it's, it's full on. He's one of the great characters in contemporary photography. When I saw her as a corpse, she was a good looking thing. He has this sort of incredible sense of freedom. You know, day is night and night is day. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what Sunday or Monday or anything like that. I, I mean, he, he's like, a, he's, he's such a free spirit and he just leads his life rather egotistically. But, uh, but he leads his life exactly how he wants to lead his life. So when I was in Memphis, uh, most of the time I was kind of living uh, at the family home. And I don't know what the deal with Bill's personal life is. In, in many ways, it's, uh, it's his business as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, it wouldn't be the first time in the world that a very gifted artist, you know, 
um, had, had big appetites and was very curious about life. So after all this time spent together and stuff, um, the last day came. And uh, it was a very interesting moment when he said, you're a crazy guy. You really are going to have to watch it to stay on track. And I really did think that that was very rich coming from Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Without any instruction, from a very early age, I could play the piano. Anything, practically. After hearing it once, not reading music, then. I would pass a quite fine piano and that mouse, every time, came from the back to the front. It was in this big hall. And every time I would pass it, I would play a few things, notes, and sometimes without any success at all. And then it got a little better and better. <laughs> time went on. So. And maybe not ever played the same one twice. Very really much like the way I particularly work today, still. By the mid-70s, Eggleston had still never exhibited in a major show. But that all changed when he showed his work to John Sikowski, the head of photography at New York's Museum of Modern Art. Sikowski was electrified by what he saw and offered the unknown artist a show at MoMA. It took, if you like, Sikowski's brilliance as a curator uh, to find these pictures from, a, you know, Eggleston's a very prolific shooter, or he certainly was then. He would have had thousands of pictures and Bill himself would probably have had very little idea which his best pictures were. He needed, if you like, that someone to knock the thing into shape, make it tight, make the thing work. To honor Eggleston's show, the museum published its very first book of color photographs, entitled William Eggleston's Guide. It was like a missionary guide, what the name came from. And the design of the book was black. Leather red cover. Guide is a great percent choices by John, really. But we worked together. We were choosing all of these in the exhibition, projecting slides on a big screen. That's how we worked. Guide is Eggleston's most personal work. In addition to friends, it also shows his family surroundings. The house in Sumner where he grew up. The carport in an almost colorless color photograph. His cousin inside the house. The photos show private moments that Eggleston shot with great discretion. That's the driveway, and uh, there was a family funeral. So Daddy and Jasper were standing right there. Uh, and 
that was the story of that photograph. But what's so uncanny is that they look so much alike. You know, uh, one, one time somebody said uh, that Daddy was a white Faulknerian figure in a black suit, and Jasper was a black Faulknerian figure in a white suit. And it's amazing how they're standing alike. And, uh, but you know, that was just the perfect example of Bill just capturing the everyday prosaic banal moment, you know. I mean, I don't even know if anybody knew that he took that photograph, you know. He had his little Leica down there and just snapped that one, and it's just turned out to be so iconic. And then that's why to this day, every funeral I go to, I always carry a camera. <laughs> Not that I'd ever get a photograph like this, but you know what I mean? But he was my uncle. In other words, he was married to my mother's sister. And he was a household servant who helped raise me, Jasper. It's like they've been together for so long, they've started, <laughs> you know, standing the same way. The thing you look for in other photographers' work is a sense of vision. There's a sense where you can recognize someone's vision by looking at their photographs. Now, that may sound a very easy thing to do, but within photography, it is one of the hardest things to actually achieve. If you like, Eggleston's a photographer's photographer because the vision is almost undescribable. It's, it's more difficult to describe than most people's vision because it's about photographing democratically and photographing nothing and making it interesting. And that would seem to me to be the most difficult thing to achieve of all. Finally, the big day arrived. The show opened on May the 25th, 1976. The opening itself was, I don't know, chaotic, anticlimactic, really. Because, as I said, it, everyone was packed in literally like sardines. I mean, it was unbelievable. Typically, Bill was 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late, and we initially got separated, he on one side of the room and I on another, on another side of the room. And you couldn't move. You literally couldn't move. William Eggleston almost slept through the opening of his first big exhibition. Perhaps he should have stayed in bed. A New York Times art critic dubbed the show the most hated exhibition of the year. Another called it totally boring and perfectly banal. Which, when you think about it, is precisely the point. Eggleston's pictures are perfectly banal. I thought it was... Wonderful having a first major show at MoMA, of all places. It got tremendous recognition. Great amount of it, negative. Well, really felt sorry for them, because it's so obvious that it's like they had the wrong job. They didn't understand what they were looking at. And the job was to understand it. Modern art, that's the museum of modern art. <laughs> and they wrote pretty stupid things. Then it became known all over the world, so. The, uh, Critics that wrote all that stuff later apologize. <laughs> they were wrong. Nowadays, journalists hang on his every word, while fans flock to see his shows in galleries all over the world. Eggleston's influence has spread to the worlds of music, of fashion, and movies. Well, I have to say, I like them all. That's important to say. I like them all. But if I had to pick, 
which one I would want. It would be between that one there. This would be my, uh, another choice. Third pick would be this fish. We talked for about three hours uh, in a little, little studio and his son and daughter were, came with him. And we had a great talk. And finally, I think Winston, his son said, you know, we you really need to, you know, you came here to photograph David and we should do that. And then we talked maybe for another hour. And then we went for a walk and he didn't have a camera. Winston had his cameras. And then we went to a certain place in the yard and all of a sudden he took the camera from Winston, pop, and then he moved a little, pop, moved a little, pop, and that was the end of it. How was the picture? The picture was good. Out of focus, but good. <laughs> <laughs> Often, very often, have these, I call them photographic dreams. They're just one beautiful picture after another, which don't exist. Short time later, I don't remember. I just remember being very happy during the dream. <laughs> Always in color. Next week, Alan Yentov begins a two-part Imagine investigation into how the arts are funded during troubled times. It's a bumpy ride from London to Brighton in a gripping crime thriller that takes no prisoners. That's the film up next tonight on BBC One. <laughs>